We are excited to be here. This conference began 16 years ago in February of 2000. And just out of curiosity, how many people were here in that first conference, February 2000? All right, so there are a few people who have been to um, every single one of our conferences. We skipped one year, 2001. So this year is our 16th year. Um, how many people have been to 15 or more of these conferences? <laughs> okay. Um, how many people have been to 10 or more? How many have been to five or more? How many is this your first time? All right, let's give it up for the first timers. So the basic idea that started in 2000 was that if you brought together a group of academics who were interested in ideas, governmental officials, industry leaders, consumer advocates, and you gave them an elevated environment, something like 5280, <laughs> you would have valuable thought-provoking discussions, particularly when you peppered the environment with intellectually engaged students. So how many students are in the audience? Raise your hand. OK, so after every panel, that's right, we can clap for the students here. That's great. <laughs> after every panel, we'll give the students the first question. And that, again, is part of the atmosphere here where we really are committed to intellectually rigorous and elevated dialogue. The students have been a part of this in the beginning in another just wonderful uh, salute. How many former students are here with us? OK, so we have had the benefit now of a generation of students coming through this program, helping one another, and building a culture of collaboration. And as part of my job in this introductory address, I need to embarrass Dale Hatfield, um, who is very modest. <laughs> But is all, I always do that, but is also true north for what we're talking about, which is dialogue that's intellectually honest, rigorous, and interdisciplinary. And that's what you're going to notice. Um, we're going to have a number of engineers on our panels. We'll have a number of lawyers, we'll have a number of business people. Lots of different backgrounds are represented because that's the world we live in. And the world we live in here at Silicon Flatirons is a world of collaboration and mentorship. And so in a very befitting um, legacy for Dale, we've set up a Dale Hatfield Scholars Program. And so a number of students this summer are going to go to Washington, DC. And we, thanks to the leadership of Preston Patton, added a private sector component to this. And they are going to work with a number of you in DC. Um, that's a very special part of this experience. And, and we thank Dale for his vision and leadership. For others who you can talk with as you've got thoughts about the conference, um, Pierre de Vries, uh, a um, senior fellow here, Ray Gifford, another um, senior fellow, Brian Tremont, Blake Reed, um, who's on the faculty, and you'll see Cristelia Garcia also on the faculty. It's uh, a phenomenal group. What I also have to start with is the uh, incredible effort that went into this conference. That first conference, I did a lot of the organization myself with students. Adam is not, Peter, Peter's not here. He was uh, one of the hardworking students on that effort. Uh, in subsequent years, Mark Walker was another. I think Mark might be here later. Here he is. Um, Mark can tell you what that looked like uh, as a student, full-time student, organizing this sort of conference. It's not a small thing to do. In that situation, I was a partner with the students doing it, so I worried about like who was getting the bagels. And the first time I had this conference, I actually had one of those anxiety dreams where you're late to your final exam and you're not sure what room it's in. And that was like the night before the conference. And now I don't, because we have an extraordinary team. So on the student side, um, Ariel Diamond has put a lot of work symposium at her. Let's give her a real round of applause. <laughs> She's also the incoming editor-in-chief of our Colorado Technology uh, Law Journal. We also have uh, Jolie Denkinger, who's our current editor-in-chief here. We have a phenomenal team led by Anna. And you'll also see Cactus, Jamie, Sarah, and Kelly. Um, this is a tremendous group who embodies the commitments to collaboration and excellence. So the substance of the conference has often involved variations on related themes around the digital broadband migration. And as Russ Hanser pointed out, those are not uh, 
modifying one another. There are two trans, uh, transitions that have happened, um, first to digital technology, increasingly to broadband technology. And that migration is one that we've largely worked through, although we're still dealing with lots of the implications. Another transition has been one of facilitating and embracing competitive markets and ending eras of regulated monopolies. The Telecom Act of 1996 is 20 years old. Had we thought the act was more relevant to what we're talking about, we'd be doing a 20-year anniversary of the act itself. But the act and much of what it sought to do didn't actually drive the changes we've had. So wireless technologies exploded, broadbands exploded. Those were not core ambitions of the act on its own terms. The act was focused on the voice telephone market, which is mostly an afterthought in today's discussions. What we have talked about this conference over the years has been generally around competition policy issues. And a couple years ago, at this podium, Tom Wheeler offered, I think he calls his regulatory seesaw, which is where you have competition, you don't need regulation, and where you don't have competition, you need regulation. He invokes this idea in a range of contexts. Uh, he evoked it two years ago here, talking about the open internet rules. Uh, he is invoked this past week talking about set-top box rules. A question that complements the role of regulation is one of antitrust law and policy, something we've often talked about at this conference. We have this year the pleasure of FTC Chairwoman Edith Ramirez, and we have Bill Baer from the Antitrust Fist coming as well. It's great to have both of them here. At that first conference, we had Joel Klein here from the Antitrust Division as well, and the role of antitrust is a great issue, uh, great concern, questions for all of us. For both regulation and antitrust, the challenge of keeping up with technologically dynamic markets is one that comes up and we continue to wrestle with. We, um, by the way, have two of the experts from the Microsoft case here um, on different panels, Ed Felton and Carl Shapiro, both were involved. Uh, that will certainly come up uh, in the conference as well. So there's so much about this conference that is special to me. I've tried to find the right metaphor for it, everything from a uh, family reunion to um, at times a uh, wonk fest. It is hard to describe it all. It's hard to describe how important all of you are to us and the relationships that have developed and can develop are deeply meaningful. The opportunity to be engaged is multifold, one of which is on Twitter. And for those who aren't checking out what the fake Preston Padden has to say, you're missing something. For those who want to see the Twitter stream, it's hashtag Silicon Flatirons. It's on the program. You can engage in your discussions in real time. There are those of you on the live stream who can't be here physically but are taking it all in. We really appreciate it. The sponsors out here um, are tremendously supportive. Uh, obviously, when you've built a staff and an organization, it takes um, financial support. The level of generosity and commitment has been phenomenal. We've built this organization through two downturns, and people have made it a priority to support Silicon Flatirons, and we don't take that for granted at all. Your ideas, your engagement are so appreciated. The uh, list of you all is in the program as well. I now do what is a little bit of a tradition, and we've pl put at different points in the program, which is Larry Strickling, who took on the job of being NTIA administrator on one condition, that he could come every year to Silicon Flatirons and visit with us. Um, one year we had to give an excuse because he was dealing with ICANN matters abroad. I think it's needless to say he would have rather been here. Um, for those of you who know the weeds on that, uh, you know that for Larry and for many of the government officials, this is a special place to share ideas and learn. And the number of government officials who come here and take it all in and learn is, again, um, humbling for us. Larry has had a phenomenal career in telecom. He has worked around these issues I've just been talking about on a number of different sides. And he went into the Obama administration and uh, barring, um, hopefully, uh, so, you know, he won't have any more accidents like uh, the one he had. He's good for the duration. And uh, at NTIA, he has overseen a lot of important efforts, including the uh, broadband stimulus, including the issues I mentioned with ICANN, uh, issues around uh, stakeholder, um, multi-stakeholder efforts to address public policy problems and uh, government spectrum. Um, he is a terrific friend of our program and friend of mine. 
with no further ado, um, Larry, please take it away. <clears throat> well, thank you, Phil. Is this on? Is this working? Getting the thumbs up. Uh, but thanks, Phil, for inviting me to speak once again at this annual conference. I think this is now my sixth appearance here as uh, head of NTIA. Um, so unless you move up the date of next year's conference, it's going to be my last. In fact, I guess if I come next year, it'll have to be to apply to become a Dale Hatfield Scholar because uh, um, I'll be facing unemployment at that point in time. Um, I did go back and look at my previous speeches uh, as a way to prepare for today, and I was struck by really how much things have changed during the term of the Obama administration. Uh, for example, when President Obama took office, the FCC still defined broadband at a speed less than one megabit per second. Now the commission talks of 25 megabits per second as being the new standard for broadband. Global internet users have more than doubled from one and a half billion at the beginning of 2009 to an estimated 3.3 billion last December. And of course, there's the wireless revolution. When President Obama took office, iPhones had only been on the market for six months, and the iPad didn't even exist. In 2011, only 27% of households used smartphones to go online, and today, only Luddites don't use a smartphone. So, yes, we've come a long way in a very short time, and it's still early. In many ways, we are not yet realizing the full impact of the digital economy, and the policy challenges will only intensify as we move to a world where our Refrigerators are creating our grocery lists through apps on our smartphones and our household smoke detectors are able to order batteries online that are delivered by drones. So we've got a lot to pay attention to. This year's conference is focused on industry structure and I'm looking forward to hearing our speakers talk about rivalry, bargaining power, barriers to entry, and switching costs and the like. Uh, these are important factors for understanding industry competition um, but at NTIA, we're focused on other values in addition to promoting competition. So for my remarks today, I want to share some of the goals, describe what we've accomplished, and then talk about what we need to do this year and beyond to ensure the sustainability of these values beyond the end of 2016. Um, where I can, I'll link our work to classic industry structure analysis, but I will hope it will be clear that to meet the challenges of the digital economy, we must take a broader view than just market structure and competition. Over the past seven years, we've been working hard to build a solid foundation for the digital economy by connecting communities to broadband, by making more spectrum available for commercial use, and by engaging stakeholders to solve pressing policy questions when the legislative or regulatory processes simply cannot respond with the necessary speed and flexibility. Our work is front and center in this digital revolution, and I am proud of what we have been able to accomplish. But we're not gonna coast this last year of the administration. We have a full agenda, and to ensure we do not lose momentum we have built, my goal is to strengthen the foundations we have built to ensure continuity and sustainability over time. So I'll start with broadband. The administration's goal from the start has been that all Americans should have access to broadband at reasonable cost. From the start, we have known that improving broadband access and adoption would pave the way to the economic revitalization of communities across America. The 2009 Recovery Act assigned NTIA the task to create a $4 billion grant program to build broadband infrastructure, to expand broadband adoption, and to map the availability of broadband in every state. This program has been a resounding success. It fully delivered on its pledges to create jobs, stimulate economic development, spur private sector investment, and open up new opportunities in employment, education, and healthcare. Our broadband grantees have deployed more than 115,000 miles of new or upgraded network. They've connected over 26,000 community anchor institutions, such as schools and hospitals, and installed or upgraded more than 47,000 personal computers in public access centers. In addition, our grantees enrolled nearly 700,000 people as subscribers to broadband services. And since we're here in Colorado, I particularly want to mention 
that the EagleNet project we funded in this state successfully brought the first fiber-based broadband service into the tiny mountain community of Silverton, which had gone for years without adequate broadband service. Today, the 67 students at Silverton School have access to educational resources they only used to dream about. These projects have already had a significant impact on economic development. Uh, we commissioned an independent study from ASR Analytics to assess the social and economic impact of our broadband grant program, and we released the report last year, although it only covers the first five years, three or actually the first four years of the program. The report showed that on average, in only two years, communities that receive broadband grants experienced an estimated 2% greater growth in broadband availability than non-grant communities. The report also concluded that the additional broadband infrastructure built by our grantees could be expected to create more than 22,000 long-term jobs and generate more than $1 billion in additional household income each year. In our broadband work, we've learned several important lessons. First, by focusing our grants on building the important middle mile, as opposed to last mile connections to home and businesses, we have reduced barriers to entry to providers who otherwise would face higher costs to connect their customers to an internet exchange point. This has been borne out in the hundreds of interconnection agreements that our grantees have signed with other providers seeking to take advantage of the dark fiber or lit services that our grantees provide on a non-discriminatory basis. Second, we have learned the importance of focusing and empowering communities as key customers and enablers for broadband services. We developed the concept of comprehensive community infrastructure projects and targeted our grants into communities that had done the necessary planning to assess the broadband needs of its citizens and businesses and had developed the organization and resources to ensure the success of a Recovery Act grant. Third, we have come to appreciate the importance of broadband adoption and have learned how to design programs that increase adoption on a sustainable basis. If you think about it, in our country, we've got the facilities to serve over 90% of our citizens, yet only about 74, 75% of our citizens subscribe. So if we're going to reach the goal of affordable broadband for all Americans, we have to reduce the barriers that prevent more people from subscribing. Cost is one of those barriers, and we at NTIA and the administration support the work of the FCC to allow lifeline support for broadband. But our grants collectively demonstrate the need for digital literacy training programs that are tailored to the specific needs of the community and the individual. In many cases, we find that who provides the training, such as family members or neighbors, is just as important to the success of the program as the content of the training. Today, we are building on these lessons by providing technical assistance to communities through our Broadband USA program. And this will be a focus for us throughout 2016. By providing communities with the tools they need to understand their broadband needs and to work with incumbent providers or others to increase investment in broadband infrastructure and to deliver tailored adoption programs to their citizens, we are making the community the focal point for broadband access and adoption. In industry structure terms, we're increasing the bargaining power of communities by empowering them to set the course for investment in their communities and not just accept what existing providers want to offer. President Obama has continued to emphasize the importance of broadband, outlining a series of initiatives aimed at closing the digital divide and fostering investment in our nation's broadband infrastructure. In 2013, the president launched Connect Ed, a public-private partnership to connect 99% of America's students to the internet through high-speed broadband within five years. Since that announcement, the public and private sectors have committed more than $10 billion of total funding and in-kind commitments. Last year, the president announced Connect Home, a new initiative with communities, the private sector, and the federal government, specifically the Department of Housing and Urban Development, to expand high-speed broadband to more families across the country. The pilot program is launching in 27 cities in one tribal nation and will initially reach over 275,000 low-income households. Last March, the President created the Broadband Opportunity Council, made up of over 20 federal agencies, and directed it to determine what actions the federal government could take to eliminate regulatory barriers to broadband deployment 
and to encourage investment in broadband networks and services. In September, the White House released the Council's report, which describes concrete steps that 25 federal agencies will take over the next uh, year to eliminate regulatory barriers and promote broadband investment and adoption. As part of this effort, NTIA will create a portal for information on federal broadband funding and loan programs to help communities easily identify resources as they seek to expand access to broadband. Turning to Spectrum, NTIA continues to play a vital role as manager of the federal government's use of Spectrum. Spectrum, as we know, is the enabler of everything from smartphones to weather satellites, from personal fitness monitors to the space station. NTIA is working closely with other federal agencies, the FCC and industry, to explore how to best ensure widespread and effective spectrum access. We're committed to ensuring that industry has the spectrum it needs for its innovative new products, but at the same time, we have to recognize that federal agencies need spectrum to perform their missions to protect the health, safety, and security of our citizens. Recognizing the importance of spectrum to our innovation economy, President Obama in 2010 directed NTIA to work with the FCC to make an additional 500 megahertz of spectrum available for commercial use by 2020. We're about halfway there to achieving that goal, and Chairman Wheeler and I are committed to identifying before the end of this year the remaining spectrum necessary to meet that 500 megahertz goal. Our key learning on spectrum in this administration is that we needed to find a new way to make spectrum available for commercial broadband, and that new way had to embrace spectrum sharing between federal agencies and industry. In 2012, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology validated what we had been saying about the need for sharing. As the PCAST report concludes, the old method of clearing spectrum of federal users and then making it available for the exclusive use of commercial providers is no longer sustainable. We've moved the easy systems, and to continue the old method of spectrum reallocation will cost too much money and take too long. The industry and their customers, as well as our economy, cannot afford the cost and delay. Moreover, over the years, the critical missions performed by federal agencies have required systems of greater and greater complexity and have increased the agency's needs for spectrum. So the opportunities to find spectrum to which to relocate federal operations are rapidly dwindling. Two key achievements last year depended on this recognition that spectrum sharing is the new paradigm. First was the successful AWS 3 auction, which raised more than $41 billion in net proceeds uh, for the government. This outcome was only made possible by the intensive collaboration between federal agencies and industry to evaluate how spectrum in the 1755 to 1780 band could be shared. Our Commerce Spectrum Management Advisory Committee, CSMAC, really stepped up to lead the work between industry and the federal agencies by organizing and overseeing months of intensive discussions. The second achievement was the FCC's decision to make 150 megahertz of spectrum available for shared small cell use in the 3.5 gigahertz band, 100 megahertz of which is used today for naval radar systems. NTIA collaborated closely with the FCC and the Department of Defense to lay the groundwork for this move, which establishes the innovative Citizens Broadband Radio Service and represents an important pivot point to the new paradigm of increasingly dynamic sharing. Again, we will continue the collaboration as implementation proceeds in order to ensure that the incumbent military users are protected as new players start operating in these systems. For this year, in addition to completing the identification of the remaining spectrum to meet the President's goal, we are focusing on how to build sustainable processes to keep the spectrum pipeline flowing. We are greatly aided by the legislation Congress passed last year to make important changes to the Spectrum Relocation Fund. The so-called Spectrum Pipeline Act allows agencies to use funds from the Spectrum Relocation Fund to pay for research and development activities that promise to increase spectrum efficiency and that may lead to repurposing spectrum for commercial use. At NTIA, we are moving quickly to implement the Spectrum Pipeline Act provisions, including just recently updating our regulations for the technical panel, which will receive the SRF funding requests and put them in a position 
to accept these new types of proposals in the near future. Now, over the years, there's been lots of well-meaning talk of giving agencies incentives to relinquish spectrum, but this change to make SRF dollars available for R&D has the potential in this area to have more impact than any other proposal that's been made on incentives. With the FCC and our other agency partners, along with industry, we continue to evaluate the feasibility of increased sharing by unlicensed devices in up to 195 megahertz of the 5 gigahertz band. The challenges to making this work are significant in each of the two separate portions of the band at issue, and industry cooperation will be pivotal in reaching conclusions on these bands this year. Beyond this, we are working with federal agencies to assess their spectrum use in another five bands totaling 960 megahertz of spectrum. Based on the results of these quantitative assessments that we expect to report soon, we will be in a position to prioritize some of these bands for more detailed sharing feasibility studies. Meanwhile, as we all continue to hear about industry plans to evolve to 5G technologies, we are working with the FCC to open up bands much higher in the spectrum range for innovative new uses, from ultra-high definition video delivery to applications for the Internet of Things. Interestingly, because of the types of uses envisioned along with advances in technology, industry now covets the higher bands once deemed unattractive, including those in the millimeter wave range. The FCC is eager to take the next steps in its associated Spectrum Frontiers proceeding and release some of this spectrum into the market and let the industry innovate and keep the U.S. at the forefront of mobile deployment and use. To build the sustainability of the effort to identify spectrum beyond the president's original 500 megahertz target, we must also do the following. First, we must develop advanced spectrum sharing technology and tools. These include smart radios that can sense which frequencies are available for use in real time, and spectrum access databases that can dynamically track who is using which bands to avoid interference to protected incumbents. Second, as our airwaves become more crowded, we need to establish processes and policies to ensure that everyone, public and private sector alike, play by the rules. After all, it won't matter how much spectrum we make available for sharing if the frequencies are too congested or too chaotic to be usable. And third, we need to promote cooperation and collaboration and build trust and buy-in across the public and private sectors so that we can identify more sharing opportunities and make it work in practice. To accomplish these goals and build sustainability, we will need to continue to rely on our CSMAC to provide us with advice. CSMAC has set a sterling example of effective government industry collaboration, and we will take the necessary steps this year to ensure that it remains an important asset in future administrations. The recently established Center for Advanced Communications here in Boulder will also be an important player with its focus on cutting edge research and development. The CAC brings together the research and engineering expertise of NTIA's Institute for Telecommunication Sciences here in Boulder, which has extensive experience conducting spectrum measurements and analysis, along with the expertise of NIST, which performs world-class research related to advanced communications technology. The key mission of the CAC is to serve other federal agencies and industry to solve some of the challenges of spectrum sharing through our combined testing, measurement, and modeling and analysis capabilities. One initiative already underway, which is CAC Spectrum Monitoring Project to measure spectrum utilization, is important since it can help identify the frequency bands of most interest for potential future sharing and lay the groundwork for the enforcement of rules to avoid interference once sharing is in place. We cannot talk about sharing the spectrum if we don't know how it's being used today. Looking to the future, our bright minds at the CAC are looking at whether there is a way to crowdsource spectrum monitoring. Monitoring spectrum use across the U.S. would be too costly for the government to take on by itself, so we need to find if there's an innovative way to get others involved. Several examples of crowdsourcing sensing already exist. For example, the Weather Underground is a network of over 180,000 members that send data from their own personal weather stations. So the question is, can we tap into the ever-increasing number of wireless devices in a similar way? Our researchers at ITS are already experimenting with the software to enable the sharing of spectrum monitoring data. 
In industry structure parlance, increasing the supply of a raw material such as spectrum can have major impacts on industry structure by enabling new entry or strengthening weaker rivals in a market. But whether it has these impacts or not is very much dependent on the regulatory decisions as to how and to whom to allocate this spectrum, a topic I'm sure will be discussed in later sessions of this conference. The third area I want to cover is the process for solving policy questions in the digital economy space. And of course here, I will refer to the multi-stakeholder process and the role it can play in facilitating new business models, which as we have seen for years, can have major impacts on industry structure. So I've been preaching on the multi-stakeholder model since my first appearance here in 2010. When I first started talking about multi-stakeholder, our public affairs people at NTAA told me I needed to find a different term because the press would never publish it. But today, if you search on the term, and go ahead, do it while we're sitting here, um, you're going to find hundreds of references. It has its own Wikipedia entry. So for the last two years, we have seen an untold number of people around the globe engage in multi-stakeholder discussions to plan for the transition of the U.S. government stewardship of the Internet domain name system. And just last December, at the United Nations 10-year review, of the World Summit on the Information Society, the United States with like-minded nations successfully negoted language, negotiated language in the final outcomes document that affirms the primacy of the multi-stakeholder approach to developing the information society. So what does this have to do with industry structure? Just as the internet is constantly evolving and disrupting existing business models, our policy process also needs to evolve. We cannot leave it issues untended. All that will do is slow down innovation on the internet and perhaps leave our businesses at a disadvantage in the global marketplace. We believe the most effective, most expedient way to tackle these issues is through multi-stakeholder processes because we've seen it work on the global stage over the past 20 years. As academics, technical experts, civil society and governments have come together on an equal footing to resolve technical and policy questions related to the Internet. In this time, the Internet has flourished. It has driven economic growth, innovation, and free expression around the globe, and a big part of its success can be attributed to multi-stakeholder governance. It's not hard to understand why this has been the case. Like the Internet itself, the multi-stakeholder model is characterized by its open participation in decentralized processes. The Internet thrives only through the cooperation of many different parties, and the model reflects this fact by enabling this diversity of stakeholders to participate, fostering a diversity of opinions and ideas. The result is more creative problem solving. It is a nimble, flexible approach, much better suited to rapidly changing technologies, business practices, and markets than traditional regulatory or legislative models. It can be adapted on needs, circumstances, and the evolution of the ecosystem. In contrast, more traditional telecommunications regulatory processes, by their very construct, have a more limited set of stakeholders and are often designed to limit direct participation or at least make it difficult for others to participate. Top-down regulatory models too often can fall prey to rigid procedures, bureaucracy, capture by incumbents, and stalemate. The ongoing work of the Internet community to develop a plan to transition our stewardship role over the Internet domain name system, the so-called IANA functions, and to improve ICANN's accountability represents the largest multi-stakeholder process ever undertaken. Not only will ICANN be stronger as a result of this effort, but a successful outcome here will serve as a powerful example to the world that the multi-stakeholder model can solve difficult issues regarding the Internet. Domestically, we're seeing examples of its success as well. NTIA conducted a multi-stakeholder process developed, that developed a code of conduct aimed at approving disclosures on mobile devices. As a result, enhanced privacy notices based on the code are now live in apps used by 200 million consumers, and the numbers are growing. The multi-stakeholder model was also used at NIST to develop the cybersecurity framework. The, that framework is helping organizations align their policies, technologies, and their day-to-day -day business operations to better protect their important data. 
Because of the successes we've seen so far with this model, we continue to embrace it as the best tool to meet our mission at NTIA to preserve and protect the internet as a platform for economic growth, innovation, and the free flow of information. This mission places us front and center at every major internet policy debate, whether it be privacy, internet governance, cybersecurity, or whatever. We're committed to making progress where we can to ensure that our digital economy continues to grow and thrive. We are putting our time and resources in this process because we know it can help build trust in the digital ecosystem. For the sustainability and continued growth of the internet, it is imperative that we preserve the trust of all actors on the internet. And the multi-stakeholder process has the ability to produce in a timely way meaningful guideposts for industry and consumers in this rapidly evolving technological environment. Now, reaching consensus in a multi-stakeholder process is not easy, and some people raise concerns about how long it takes. It took us a year for the process that resulted in the code for mobile application disclosure. But a one-year process to make substantial progress on a policy issue impacting millions of consumers is lightning speed in Washington. Complex policy issues typically take years to make their way through the regulatory and legislative morass of Washington. Most efforts end in failure, and the few that do reach a conclusion inevitably solve a problem that no longer exists or has been overtaken by newer issues that themselves need to be addressed. The losers in this process are more often than not the disruptors, the people with the new business models to upset existing industry structure. In 2017, I'm sorry, 2016, we will continue to explore and promote use of the multi-stakeholder model in a number of environments. On the privacy front, we have two multi-stakeholder processes underway, one to develop best practices on the privacy, transparency, and accountability of unmanned air aircraft systems, drones, and the other to develop a code of conduct related to facial recognition technology. And this past September, we launched a third process looking at best practices for cybersecurity vulnerability disclosures. We'll continue to explore with input from stakeholders other policy challenges that these processes can tackle. For example, we plan to issue a request for comment shortly asking questions about whether there are policy areas related to the Internet of Things that would be appropriate for multi-stakeholder engagement. I've asked my policy team to prepare an evaluation of our use of the multi-stakeholder model to tackle these Internet policy problems over the last five years. We're going to examine how we've approached the problems, what we perceive as our gaps in participation and implementation, and make recommendations on how we can enhance and sustain this model. We'll be looking for feedback from all of you as we evaluate the model and formulate our recommendations. But that's part of the beauty of the model. It's adaptable and flexible in a way that regulatory approaches never could be. So it's an exciting time to be involved in these issues. Our world is changing right before our eyes, perhaps at a faster pace than ever before in history, and the policy decisions we make in the next few years will have a profound impact on the digital landscape in the years to come. So, to close my last speech at Silicon Flatirons as NTIA Administrator, I do want to take a moment to thank all the men and women who serve the public as our staff and congratulate them on these and other accomplishments of the last seven years. Several of our folks, including some prominent alumni, are in the audience today, and I would like to recognize them. Uh, Anna Gomez, the former Deputy Administrator, uh, Tom Power, former Chief of Staff, Glenn Reynolds, our current Chief of Staff, I saw Keith Gremban, who runs our lab at ITS in Boulder. Um, we even brought back Dale Hatfield as a, a part-time employee for several months to take advantage of his expertise. And I was told Cyril Dad would be here, but I didn't see him in the audience, uh, uh, who ran our congressional affairs work for many years before joining Level 3 a few months ago. But thanks to all of you. In fact, please give them a round of recognition. <laughs> I apologize if I missed somebody that I didn't see, but you'll tell me about it at the break. Um, in any event, at NTIA, we're going to be working tirelessly in 2016 to cement these advances we've talked about this morning. And we want to work with all of you to leave a framework for sustainable and continued progress in the future. So thank you for listening.